we have to ask. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone to our, our 20, 2022 uh, annual lecture in the Department of Sociology. The lecture this year is going to be presented by Professor Pat Armstrong, and the lecture is titled Feminist Political Economy, A Promising Approach to Public Sociology. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Thomas. I'm the chair of the sociology department, and I'll uh, be introducing Pat, and I'll also uh, help to moderate uh, the question and, and discussion period after the lecture. Uh, to begin, uh, we'll start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, as members of the York University community, we recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. We acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tecaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Now, I'd like to thank the research committee of the sociology department for organizing uh, our annual lecture this year. And of course, I'd like to uh, extend a, a big thank you to Pat for agreeing to share her work with us. I'm gonna introduce Pat now. And um, for those of you who are familiar with Pat or her work, uh, you'll understand that this is gonna take me a minute. Um, please uh, have a seat, make yourselves comfortable. <sighs> Pat is a distinguished research professor in sociology at York University uh, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. She's held a Canada Health Services Research Foundation, Canada Institute of Health Research Chair in Health Services. Among her awards are the Ontario Health Coalition's Ethel Mead Award for Excellence in Research in the Public Interest, the YWCA Toronto Women's of, Woman of Distinction Award, the Canadian Federation of Nurses Unions Bread and Roses Award, and York University's Faculty of Graduate Studies Postdoctoral Supervisor of the Year Award. Pat is a prolific academic and tireless public intellectual who has done most of her research working with unions and com community organizations, focusing on the fields of social policy, of women, work, and the health and social services. She has published widely, co-authoring and co-editing such books as Washware and Care, Clothes and Laundry in the Nursing Homes, The Privatization of Care, the case of nursing homes, creative teamwork, developing rapid site switching ethnography, troubling care, critical perspectives on research and practices, shaping academe for the public good, women's health, intersections of research, policy, and practice, critical to care, the invisible woman in health services, and of course, wasting away the undermining of Canadian healthcare. Pat was chair of Women in Healthcare Reform, a group funded for more than a decade by Health Canada and was acting director of the National Network for Environments and Women's Health. Pat has served as both chair of the Department of Sociology at York and director of the School of Canadian Studies at Carleton. And while I was scrolling through that, I could continue. There is uh, so much more to say. I'll just say that Pat is also you know, a wonderful colleague, uh, a wonderful mentor, and um, we've all, those of us in the Department of Sociology and those of us who have had the opportunity to work with Pat over the years um, have just immensely benefited from her, uh, her insights, her energy, and her just constant and tireless work in these areas that I've been mentioning. So uh, with great pleasure, I'll turn things over to Pat Armstrong and uh, please uh, join me in extending her uh, a virtual uh, and warm welcome. Thank you so much, Mark. I, I want to thank the research committee as well and the department and all of you folks that I've learned so much from over the years and hope I can continue to do so, um, including Mark from you when I was served on your thesis committee. Um, we all work on specific indigenous territories and I would like to thank them for allowing me to do so. So how to sum up feminist political economy? Well, there's a story about a security guard who each night stopped a worker and demanded the worker remove the cover from the wheelbarrow he was leaving with because the guard was sure the worker was stealing something each time. But there was nothing in the wheelbarrow when he took the tarp off. 
When this construction was finished, the guard once again stopped the worker and said, I won't charge you, but please tell me what you were stealing. And the worker responded, wheelbarrows. Feminist political economy seeks to make visible what's hidden, including the multiple forces, relations, and conditions of work behind the theft. Who benefits and who does not, in what ways, when, with what consequences for individuals and collectives. And it means thinking through why gender in all its intersections matters and how it matters for whom, with the intent of developing strategies building towards social justice. So who are the feminist political economists? Well, I, when I was preparing for today, I received comments on a draft book chapter. The editor objected to me calling an author a feminist political economist when they said she was really a sociologist. I don't have to tell anyone in York's sociology department that sociologists can be feminist political economists. Indeed, some of our best known sociologists are feminist political economists. Some of them are on this call today. Uh, and many others, of course, are also elsewhere in the university or are fellow travelers, I would say. Indeed, as I started to draft this lecture, I realized there are far too many to reference here today. I wanna begin by briefly highlighting some roots of feminist political economy before moving on to some ways FPE approaches can make these forces, relations, and conditions visible in the wake of the pandemic's impact on long-term care. I'm not using Canadian to refer to citizenship or some narrowly defined nation, but rather approaches to develop by those who live or write from this country in an effort to understand our experiences in context. Understanding Canadian experiences may not seem like an, it may seem now like an odd concern, but Actually, when I was a student at U of T uh, and doing my undergraduate work there, I never had a book that commented on Canada at all. So sparked by the turbulence of the 60s and by articles by Peggy Morton and Margaret Benston, FPE remains a theory in progress in terms of both the political economy bit and in terms of the feminist bit. As we seek to understand how things work and why they work that way, telling us where to look, how to look, and what to do with what we find. In keeping with feminist practices, FPE is about shared learning from and with others, supporting various ways of seeing. This is why I speak of we, even though this talk is my perspective as a participant in the collective process. My hope is that my interpretation and application will resonate with the many others and spark some discussion especially where it does not resonate. 40 years ago, when the UK sociologist Michelle Barrett came to Carlton to talk about her 1980 book, Women's Oppression Today, she was surprised by, quote, the extremely active and lively feminist movement and a flourishing Canadian socialist feminist literature. She was surprised because she said, little of this work was known in Britain or the United States. Although I would add, we knew lots about them. Barrett talks about this surprise in the introduction to The Politics of Diversity, a collection of articles by authors from Canada that she edited with Roberta Hamilton, whose PhD thesis had been published in 1978 as The Liberation of Women. As they make clear in the introduction, the roots of our feminist political economy are activist. Those engaged in developing FPE theory, evidence and analysis are often directly engaged in struggling for social justice within and outside academe. Indeed, many where and are not in the classroom at all. Feminist political economists work in unions and community organizations, in factories and law offices and healthcare and even government. And much of FPE research done, is done in partnership with non-academic organizations. And I would say many of those people who are embedded as FPE is, are graduates of our program. The roots are also broad, based on confronting and rigorously debating, quote, the realities of women's oppression and the adequacy or otherwise of socialist analysis and doing so from multiple perspectives and locations as Barrett and Hamilton say. They also write that Canadians talk to each other, indeed shout at each other, 
across barriers of theory, analysis, and politics than in Britain, for example, would long since have created an angry truce or silent pluralism. Hamilton and Barrett see this debate across divisions as a reflection of the scale and diversity of the country and the need for solidarity among progressive movements and a recognition rather than a denial of division and differences. In other words, we are so few and so mixed that we're pushed to talk to each other and learn from each other, not necessarily to agree, but to at least address alternate approaches and locations clarifying our own position in the process. And Barrett was surprised that these feminists let men in, unlike many other similar feminist organization, especially in those times. Indeed, he was one of those I shout with and against. Theory is central to the feminist political economy. The articles in the diversity book reflect an early emphasis on trying to make sense of Marxist categories in gender terms. What was called the domestic labor debate is one example. The, this debate played out to some extent in the pages and editorial board of the Canadian journal Studies in Political Economy, where there certainly was heated discussion and some shouting, but we remained friends. As Bonnie Fox explained in The Politics of Diversity, it was, quote, assumed that to understand women's oppression, it's essential to develop theory end of quote, theory that was understood as systematic and focused on making change. In Canada, this debate began as an effort to determine whether Marx's distinction between productive and unproductive labor and the associated one between use value and exchange value would promote understanding of what feminist political economists came to call reproductive labor. In the process, we explored how domestic labor is shaped by and contributes to the search for profit. Given the centrality of class in addressing oppression, we debated whether women formed a class on the basis of their domestic labor and constituted a reserve army of labor, as Patricia Conley argued. Our effort to put biology into the analysis, as other feminists did, prompted a debate about whether gender should be understood at the highest level of analysis, albeit recognizing that gender isn't a single category or one with clear boundaries. These were complex and sophisticated debates, but they tended to rely on somewhat simplified dichotomies. Although the introduction to the politics of diversity mentions racism, the only article in the book that comes close to addressing racism is Roxana Ng's piece on immigrant women and none address indigenous issues, sexual identity or disabilities to name only some of the missing communities. At the same time, these 1980 debates introduce new ways of using the old analytical tools and in the process transforming them while moving away from such a reliance on Marx and Engels. FB approaches remain materialist in the sense of beginning the research and analysis with how we meet or not our daily and generational needs. They remain dialectical in the sense of tending to contradictions and conflicts and they are still historical in the sense of space, time, and place, setting the context as well as in the sense of making our own history, albeit not under conditions of our own choosing. In the process, these analytical tools became understood in new ways. The analysis became more complex and less dichotomous, both because of the debates and because of another feature of Canadian feminist political economy, namely the emphasis on research. Like E.P. Thompson, we saw research as a dialogue between theory and evidence. Theory is assessed and altered as a result of listening, as Dorothy Smith, among others, encouraged us to do, to the voices of those who actually live the experiences and of being accountable to them, as Nathan Andrews and Sylvia Bawa make clear in a recent article. The research makes the theory concrete, altering it in the process as we assess how useful it is to understanding how things work. It is an effort both to make the political personal, connecting larger social structures and relations to individual lives, and to make the personal political, encouraging and learning from action to transform unjust inequitable conditions. 
Smith also talked about the standpoint of women, as did many others, arguing that widespread perceptions of individuals as women are real in their consequences, and that bringing together those identifying as women around issues they share is critical to action. As Patricia Conley and I argue in the introduction to our 1992 book, Feminism in Action, our identity as women may be the most salient identity as a particular place and time, and thus become a basis for action. But we always seek to move beyond binaries in analysis and action to understand the structures that create other simultaneous forms of oppression that permeate gender and to identify those that are the most salient for action in particular places and times. Context and intersections matter. Smith also raised important questions about evidence, objectivity and methods, questions that have been taken up by others such as Eric Maklowski and Lorna Weir. For us, addressing such questions means working in multidisciplinary teams based on constant collective reflection and critique. It means searching through multiple methods for promising rather than best practices for transformations, asking for whom, when, under what conditions, always understanding that it depends. It means identifying the assumptions behind the evidence, what counts as evidence, whose evidence counts, and how evidence is applied. These are critical questions, especially in these times. Which brings me to the now. The theory and research combined with the activism against depression that builds connections with various communities means that FBE is about public sociology and social justice. This is especially the case when it comes to the care economy. The FPE focus on care is not surprising, given that women do the overwhelming majority of paid and unpaid health and childcare work, with the heaviest work disproportionately done by those who are racialized and or newcomers. Women are also the majority of those who use health services and of those who take the children to care services, although there are significant inequities among women in terms of access to and treatment within those services, as many sociologists in our department have shown. All of this brings me to the second part of this lecture, namely how FPE can help make the wheelbarrows and the forces surrounding it visible in the pandemic, suggesting ways forward based on social justice. As Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. The theory, research and analysis on care work has built a strong basis for exposing the personal as political and for linking the global to the national as well as to the very local in these days of capital's international power and neoliberalism's dominance in governance. The commitment to the right to care, both in the sense of access to care and the right to provide care under decent conditions is central to the FPE approach as is the understanding that care is a relationship, albeit one characterized by inequities in power, rights and capacities that change with time and place. This takes care well beyond the narrowly defined medical model to a structural determinants of health one. Equally important is the commitment to shared responsibility for care organized and decommodified at multiple levels based on participatory decision-making and on equity rather than simply on equality. The pandemic's devastation in Canadian long-term care and what are most commonly called nursing homes provides an opportunity for sharing that understanding, helping people take the advice of a pumper sticker I recently saw that said, don't believe everything you think. It's an opportunity to encourage action together that promotes social justice. Long-term residential care is a barometer of economic, political, cultural, and social conditions, as well as of values. It's where some of our most vulnerable live and work. It raises issues that go well beyond the specific services and practices, issues such as fundamental human and social rights, <clears throat> systemic discrimination, the role of the state and of profit, 
responsibilities of individuals, families, markets, and governments, work organization and skills, and approaches to care. We have years of research and analysis to draw on to make visible the conditions and relations that provide the background for the devastation. Let me highlight some of them we've helped make more visible. Nursing homes are places that provide 24 hour nursing care, receive significant public funding and are heavily regulated by the state. Public organizations determine who is eligible for admission and although fees are charged, these fees are regulated and subsidies help ensure that the ability to pay is not a factor for gaining access. Four out of five residents are women and women make up over 80% of the paid and of the unpaid workforce. At least a third of those paid to the work are newcomers or migrants as Tanya Descoupita, Lone Goldring and others have long pointed out. And a significant proportion are racialized. They're concentrated in the lowest paid jobs, those defined as the least skilled. As FP has taught us to see, these women have not passively accepted conditions. The majority are in unions, although the proportion that are unionized decreases as you go down the hierarchy. And while unions have undoubtedly had some success, their efforts have been limited by structural conditions and relations, as Mark Thomas and others has made clear. And I want to talk about some of it now. Sorry, I have to keep drinking because I'm not used to talking this much these days. For a host of reasons, nursing homes have been largely invisible in public discourse. Gender dominance is one of those reasons. Researchers like Nancy Mandel and Barbara Hansen have long pointed out that the dominant culture in Canada places little value on old ladies, especially a value evident when some politicians responded to the high death rates in nursing homes by saying that people are old and, and close to dying anyway. And the work of providing care for them is often defined as unskilled and of little value. As Meg Luxton said of domestic labor in her 1980 book, More Than a Labor of Love, care work is full of contradictions. Like domestic work, care work is simultaneously understood as essential and as low skilled, as something any woman can do and wants to do by virtue of being a woman and thus of little monetary value. The bulk of the work is done by those who in Ontario are called personal support workers. The job description indicates limited formal training or at least limited recognized formal training, even though many have formal credentials from other countries, while others have learned a great deal on the job, invisible education that further contributes to the undervaluing. Feminist political economists have long struggled over how to understand skill. Indeed, skill is addressed by James Gaskell in The Politics of Diversity. Recognizing that skills are not simply individual, independent, objective, and easily measured capacities, we've also made visible the extent to which care involves complex learned abilities that include understanding care as a relationship. You've only to watch, as we have done, a PSW assisting an older adult to eat when the person has dementia, little ability to swallow, is frightened, hates peas, and is likely to have what are now called responsive behaviors to them, to see how skilled and demanding the job is. The skill is particularly obvious when the residence is treated with dignity and respect. The assumptions about skill reinforced by racism, sexism, and the structural barriers newcomers and migrants face contribute to their use as a reserve army to fill gaps in care without improving working conditions. And as Avi Bourgeau makes clear, ethical recruitment of healthcare workers from other jurisdictions needs to acknowledge the effect that their recruitment has on the region, province, and country they leave behind, describing another contradiction in the global care chain. There is an additional important reason for the low value and invisibility of nursing homes. One that goes beyond age, sexism and racism. None of the homes fit into what Jane Jensen and Denise Saint-Martin call the social investment discourse with the public contribution understood as preparation for the labor force. 
nor do nursing homes fit easily into the notion of social reproduction that is understood as the daily and generational production and maintenance of the labor force, the approach Benston introduced so long ago. None of the residents will be producing exchange value and are unlikely to produce more use value. Moreover, these homes do not fulfill Benston's idea of socialized so social reproduction that builds a future. And in the dominant culture, of course, youth is uh, not high, is what is highly valued. Back in the day when I was teaching in a CGEP in Montreal, I used to ask students to write in the day in their life when they're 40. These 18 year olds found it impossible to think, although <laughs> some, of the, some of the males wrote about having a, a fancy car. <coughs> <coughs> they struggle to think about being old. It's been hard to mobilize public support when so many do not even want to think about growing old, let alone think about moving into a nursing home. Indeed, some of my best friends simply say they will never go in one and don't want to talk about it. <coughs> Excuse me. This is not to say that capitalism sees no value in what is termed the aging population or, in, atta or in, in attaching little value to the work. Indeed, there's lots of gold to be made from the golden years. Charlene Harrington and colleagues 2017 study report that the global search for, for profit from older people produced returns as, as high as 28% in elder care. And the search for this gold has been supported and even promoted by the state and built on the low value of workers. In Ontario, the Harris government started what I like to call an affirmative action program for corporate ownership of the publicly subsidized care homes. The bidding process favored them. And today nearly 60% of those homes are for profit. Nursing homes are an attractive investment given a guaranteed full house and guaranteed payment from the public purse even as governments justify profit returns in the name of returns for risk taking. However, to make this highly unionized sector even more attractive to capital, as long responder McGregor explained, the 2002 BC Liberal government removed job security and contracting out protections that healthcare unions had struggled hard to win through sectoral bargaining. But the promotion of the for-profit sector was not restricted to the ownership of homes. Within the public and not-for-profit ones that we still have, many of the services that remain are contracted out to for-profit firms. This is especially the case with what Romano <coughs> Commission on the Future of Healthcare called, and I would say in defiance of the determinants of health research and the care work literature, ancillary services namely food, clothing, laundry, and housekeeping. As uh, Mark mentioned, Suzanne Day and I, uh, Suzanne is, by the way, a graduate of our program, and I took this issue up in a book called Wash, Wear, and Care, using clothes and laundry to make concrete, both that they are critical to care and that the work is dangerous to the health of the women who do it under these conditions. But contracting out doesn't stop there. Increasingly, as Tamara Daly has shown, there's also, this is also the case with management as it is with nursing care through the agencies that Leo Vosco has long exposed for their poor employment practices and high cost to employers. We would add by disrupting continuity, agency work further undermines care for residents and care work for the staff. These contracted service workers are much less likely than nursing home employees to be unionized or employed full time, pushing them to work in multiple places during the pandemic. Research from an NFP perspective exposed the negative consequences for residences, for workers, and for the public purse of this privatization. One consequence is that more of the decisions are made behind closed doors by private sector and increasingly global actors, even when the money comes from the public purse. We're told it's necessary to ensure competition and to protect private interests, even though it is profoundly undemocratic. And more of the decisions are made in terms of profit. Not surprisingly, recent research by Martin August found that 
When financial firms own and operate or seniors housing, they prioritize profit at the expense of other goals. Also not surprisingly, COVID data shows that the death rates are significantly higher in for-profit homes. Given that labor is the biggest cost, labor has been a focus of cost savings. Efficiency defined in for-profit terms means just enough or even barely enough care and a detailed division of labor with a focus on easily counted tasks that limit autonomy for residents and workers. Staff pay and staffing levels are lowest in for-profit homes and more of the staff are part-time or contracted while pressure ulcers falls and hospitalization rates are higher. Meanwhile, the neoliberal admiration for for-profit strategies evident in new public management approaches means that managerial strategies in the publicly owned homes are increasing like the, like those in the for-profit ones, reinforced by limited public funding. The lines between public and private are blurred. In Ontario, less than half the workers are full-time and illness and injury rates are amongst the highest of all sectors, even before COVID. It's more dangerous to be a PSW than a police officer. 30 years ago, Jackie Schwanier wrote about how nurses we interviewed were initially pleased with new counting strategies that would record all they did in a day and how long it took. They were convinced it would show the need for more staff. Well, it did, but then the numbers were recalculated to show too many staff. Such numbers on bathing time led Canada's chief nursing officers to say the only way to bathe someone in the time allowed was to throw the person in a chair, hose them down, and let them drip dry. Even then, we were recording the high turnover, burnout, and exhaustion rates linked to heavy workloads, low pay, understaffing, and lack of power. We talked about the management measurement of the, as the 92nd minute. With the focus on tasks narrowly defined as, as necessary, Workers go home feeling guilty for not being able to provide the care they know should be provided, suffering from what is increasingly described as moral injury. I vividly remember interviewing a group of nurses and asked what this meant when they went home. One nurse responded, no sex. I expected a, a laugh to follow, but none did. They were just nods. There was no work-work balance let alone life-life balance that could come with both home and labor force work rewarding and thus de both defined as life. This research on the impact of the for-profit efficiency led us to coin the phrase, the conditions of work are the conditions of care. And just enough staff and just enough care during pre-COVID times meant life-threatening levels during the pandemic threatening to the staff as well as the residents. Canadian governments have further supported the for-profit sector by failing to provide enough places in nursing homes to meet the demand and by making access to services more complicated. The absence of spaces forces older people into retirement homes where there's no regulation of fees and few other regulations to protect those paying the high rates or those providing care. This is one reason why we don't have accurate data on the death rates and the, on them and during COVID. Price puts these places beyond the reach of too many and especially of women, a particular group of women who are more likely than white men to be poor. At the same time, the women who work in these homes are much less likely to have union protections. These efficiency strategies to reduce costs and promote profit also shift work from paid to unpaid labor. As many of us have shown, the shift often means both more unpaid work for women and greater inequity in access to care. With the increased focus on for-profit delivery, austerity, and new technologies, people are sent home from hospitals quicker and sicker. This means leaving the cost to be covered by the person needing care and the care to be provided by those without formal training, or what feminists call uh, compulsory altruism. The care gaps in nursing homes pressure both those otherwise paid for the tasks and relatives to make up for the lack of care through unpaid work. As Donna Baines has shown, when care gaps appear in care services, it is mainly women otherwise paid for the work 
who feel responsible and are held responsible to fill the gaps through unpaid work. Meanwhile, families with money fill some of those gaps by hiring private companions for their relatives in nursing homes. They rely primarily on newcomers who have no other options or protections, creating the kinds of conditions for these companions similar to working in private homes, conditions long exposed as oppressive by people like Sadef Eric Kroc. Regulations don't necessarily help. Comparing responses to major nursing home scandals, our research team found that scandals were mainly found in for-profit homes, but instead of addressing structural issues like ownership and staffing levels, the response primarily focused on more regulations for staff and residents, providing an example of resistance turning into losses. Accountability comes to be defined as counting, with much of the counting work falling on the workers in what power calls the audit culture. Inspections and enforcement to ensure even these regulations are followed were limited pre-pandemic and disappeared during it. There has been, in other words, privatization of ownership and governments, of cost and managerial strategies, of work and responsibility, all of which have unjust consequences for those who need and those who provide care. The impact has been felt primarily by women in all their intersections, albeit in inequitable ways. The justification for an institution of these structural developments has contributed to neoliberal ideas invading our heads, the most invisible of all processes underway. Personal responsibility, autonomous rational actors, choices based on notions of competition and the right to buy, and market mechanisms, as well as the need for reducing both taxes and public services, all become what Antonio Gramsci called common sense, or at least the only alternative. This is complemented by global warnings about the tsunami of the aging population that will devastate public budgets. In short, research and analysis by feminist political economists and others have made visible the forces behind the conditions, including the international search for profit through the care economy, the blurred lines between public and private with neoliberalism, the undervaluing of care work, and the additional exploitation of the global care chain that set the stage for devastation in long-term care. <coughs> oh, I'm, I'm getting to the end. <laughs> Which brings me to the pandemic. The pandemic hit nursing homes hard and accounted for 80% of the deaths in the first wave. <coughs> and to our shame, COVID hit nursing homes much harder in Canada than other high income countries. Unions had to take uh, homes to court to access personal protective equipment. The military was called into five Ontario homes, four of them for profit and none publicly owned. Shocked by what they found, the military took the unprecedented step of making the report public. Although the military personnel were shocked, their stories indicated how COVID was mainly exaggerating what research and analysis had already revealed. The importance of clean was never so obvious, food and social support so critical, and the undervaluing of residents and staff so evident. The state stepped in, not only with the military, but also by seeking to raise the prestige of these heroes while raising wages, providing some sick leave, ensuring some daycare, and recognizing the precarity that forced workers to take jobs in multiple homes. Initially, at least, families were prevented from entering the home to provide care until the gaps in care left by their absence became so obvious, and so did the importance of care that goes well beyond a medical model the death rates were higher for those without family or friends. Public commissions were formed and years of evidence along with individual testimonies were integrated into the recommendations, many of which reflected what feminist political economists along with other researchers, unions and community organizations have been arguing for years. The federal government promised legislation even the prime minister started using the notion that the conditions of work are the conditions of care. The Ontario government promised a minimum of four hours of nursing care per resident per day, well above the current level of less than three hours. 
But before we get too excited about the prospects for the future, we need to look at what is in and behind the wheelbarrows. Under the cover of COVID, indeed, using the disasters in the nursing homes to justify the move to expand services, Ontario is funding new for-profit development, including by some of the homes that had the worst disasters. New legislation confirms the future of for-profit. The four hours of care will come for, not come for years, will be a target rather than a requirement, and will be measured as an average across homes, the report. Ontario is also creating a new category called resident assistant, making it possible to hire those with virtually no formal training to care for the people in long-term care. In a repetition of the past, several governments are looking to import labor without promising to improve the conditions that contribute to low retention and high injury rates. Meanwhile, the Ontario wage increases are temporary and the government is refusing to budge on Bill 124, legislation that limits wage increases for both health and education workers to the 1% increase while not applying this limit to most police and firefighters. Some heroes. At the same time, the other notion of contradiction, namely that our success can turn into losses, is evident in the efforts of families, broadly defined, to regain access to their relatives in nursing homes. Families brought much needed care and entering homes reduced worry levels of families. The absence of families demonstrated the importance of social supports and both the narrowly defined tasks of paid care and the gaps created by low staffing levels. However, the return of families to provide a wider range of care also reinforces the notion that this is unskilled work and helps undermine the demand for more staff. In the wake of the disastrous impact COVID had on long-term care, we've heard calls to burn down the nursing homes and care for everyone in their private homes. The call ignores the many without homes and those with unsafe homes, both in the sense of physical structures and of abuse, and ignores the benefits that can come with well-designed congregate care. But it also ignores how, even with more public home care, much of the work would fall to women unpaid and untrained for the job to provide 24 hour care. Work that research has shown is often dangerous to their health. Or it will be done by women, most often women who are racialized and are newcomers, who are hired by families to labor in an underground economy where there are no labor or other protections. In sum, the crisis has created an opportunity for transformation but we have to make sure any gains we make in the wake of the pandemic do not turn quickly into losses and work instead for an alternative future, always raising the question of who benefits in what ways with what consequences. Our shared analysis provides a basis for developing what Andre Gortz called revolutionary reforms, reforms that fundamentally alter what Dorothy Smith called relations of ruling. It starts with decommodifying care and reorganizing the work so the workers have the right to care. At the same time, we have to constantly watch for contradictory consequences of the state and prepared to respond. So in conclusion, the pandemic demonstrates all too early, not all too clearly, sorry, not only how the political economy shapes population health in fundamentally inequitable ways, within and across countries, but also how population health has an impact on the political economy and does so in inequitable ways. It exposed how economically and socially precarious so many people are, as we have done in other ways in the past, raising important questions, not only about market strategies, but also about government supports, regulations and government responsibility in a wide range of areas that are critical to controlling the pandemic. It has exposed the fundamental weaknesses in neoliberal approaches and how they contribute to what Johan Galtung and more recently Paul Farmer termed structural violence. And the pandemic makes it clear that gender in all its intersectional relations matters. So does care. Our collective research has been central to that exposure to showing how indigeneity, let's try that again, how in, indigeneity, 
citizenship status, racialization, gender, disability, sexual identity, and geographic location, among other social relations, shape access to services and the nature of services received, as well as access to decent work, decent pay, housing, health, dignity, and respect. The research shows that we need the state at the same time as we need to transform it in democratic ways. The specific case of long-term care provides an indicator of social justice, given that these are places where some of the most vulnerable live and work. It also provides a way to see theory in action and to see what counts as evidence, help us to, helping us to guide ways forward. I've been arguing that FBE offers a promising, but not the only way to identify and understand these injustices and the ways to address them. Although FBE has moved away from some Marxist categories and continues to learn from other ways of seeing, it still begins analysis with how people provide for food, shelter, jobs, joy, babies, and care, as well as with ideas about these. In asking who benefits, when, and in what ways, it includes but goes beyond the search for profit and the role of the state at multiple levels. It makes conflicts and contradictions, including those that turn victories into losses, central to understanding how things work. And it is historically specific, locating the analysis in particular times and places for particular people, recognizing that it depends. Because many feminist political economists continually work in partnership with unions and community organizations, learning from and with them, we are building the trust and the skills that teach us academics how to be public sociologists. It has made it possible to have an impact in this crisis. In these times, it's hard to feel, not feel like the divers who reached the bottom of the ocean only to receive a message saying, surface immediately, ship sinking. In the aftermath of the pandemic, we could move to more collective and more democratic strategies based on a recognition of shared responsibilities, or we could move towards more privatization of care. I would argue that we are and can make a difference. Long-term care is an example of how public sociology and FPE can help us see what is hidden in plain sight so that we can address the forces at work. Indeed, that should have been the title of this talk. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing from you about your understanding of feminist political economy. <laughs>